Welcome to the pre-recorded part of the first tutorials for ML Live session. Today we will look at four different topics, starting with an introduction to machine learning. Machine learning has been around for about 100 years, starting in early 20th century under the name statistical analysis, part of which was developed here at the UCL. In the 50s and 60s, a series of conferences were held on artificial intelligence, which really solidified the field. And in the 80s and 90s, machine learning really took its shape as we see today with the development of neural networks and things like support vector machines. Modern machine learning, which uses large amounts of data, called big data, has been around since the late 2000s. As a multidisciplinary field, machine learning borrows from all these different areas. For example, from the field of statistical analysis, machine learning borrows the notions of random variables, statistics of these random variables, probability, distribution, and statistical modeling. From the fields of data mining and big data, Machine learning borrows the notion of learning and predicting. Imagine I have some data X that I want to use to predict some quantity Y. I can train a model, which I can denote by F, which takes in X, has some parameters P, and it outputs Y. So there are two stages to this process. The learning stage assumes that I have x and y that is i have a lot of pairs of the input data and the output that i want for that data and i use those to estimate the parameters of the model p and the second stage predicting which is that i've already learned the parameters p i'm given a new data point x and i'm trying to predict the quantity of interest y for it from the field of artificial intelligence machine learning borrows a lot of inspiration on how to design the models that he uses. For example, here on the left, uh, you can see what is called a fully connected neural network, which as you can guess by the name is inspired by the brain. On the right, we can see what is called a convolutional neural network, which is inspired by how the brain processes visual signals. So what is machine learning? Well, there are several different steps to it listed here, um, and they go as follows. Firstly, we'd like to understand the data that we're given. Data is not just a bunch of numbers. It often has context, and we want to know that we're interpreting these numbers in the correct context. For example, when given a number, I want to understand whether it represents a real quantity like the weight of an apple, or whether it represent something more abstract, like a class saying that cats are one and dogs are two. I'd also like to understand more about all the numbers I'm given for a particular feature. I would like to know about the distribution of this feature. After I understand my data, I'm going to perform a data split. I'm going to split my data into a training and a validation or a test set. The purpose of this is such that I can use the training data to train my uh, model, as we talked before, and I can use the validation or test data to check whether what I've learned from the training uh, data generalizes well to new unseen data. Training the model requires that I define a performance metric for it. For example, if I'm trying to classify cats from dogs, I'll be interested in the accuracy of this classifier. Or if I'm trying to predict the price of a house based on the square footage it has, it's going to be the difference between my prediction and the actual price. Once I define my performance metrics, I'm going to start building candidate models. This means choosing one of or several of the models that I know and training them on the training data, evaluating them on the validation data, and then trying to explain the models and perform model selection. That is, choose which of the models that I've trained I think works best. Finally, once I've done all this, I'm going to 
use the best model that I have to try and predict. Let's now talk about the different types of problems that machine learning is involved with. Firstly, as you can see on the top, machine learning can be broadly split into two categories, supervised and unsupervised learning. Let's start with an example of supervised learning called regression. This is exactly the earlier example I gave, that given the size of a house in square feet, I want to predict the price that it will go for on the market. The reason this is a regression problem is that I'm trying to predict a real value. The next problem we look at is classification. In the example on the right, I'm given a lot of data points, each of which represents the leaf size and the number of leaves per twig for a particular plant. I'd like to, given these features of a plant, decide which of three species it belongs to. This is a classification problem because I'm trying to predict a discrete value, a class or a label. The third type of problem on our list is clustering. Clustering is an example of unsupervised learning in which we're not provided with the quantity of interest that we'd like to predict. In the example on the right, we're given several Simpsons characters on the top and we'd like to cluster them into different buckets. Now, because we're not provided those labels, we can do so in several different ways. For example, we can cluster them into gender groups, as we see on the right, bottom right, or we can cluster them into buckets based on whether they're part of the Simpsons family, as we can see in the left example. The line between supervised and unsupervised learning is sometimes fuzzy. For example, with our last type of problem, the causality problem, we can be given a lot of data on whether two quantities are correlated. For example, smoking and lung cancer. And we'd like to infer which causes which. Is it the fact that smoking causes lung cancer or is it just that people with lung cancer are more likely to smoke? Surprisingly, machine learning can often allow us to answer this question with certainty. Let's move on to the second topic of today's session, data preprocessing. As you can see, data preprocessing is one of the most important steps in ML. In the industry, it's often the case that 90% of the work being done in deploying a machine learning model is in the data preprocessing part. Data preprocessing often involves several different steps. It is very common to rescale our data, which means to subtract the mean of the data and divide by its standard deviation. Data can be represented in many different ways. For example, I can represent my weight in kilograms or stone or pounds, or I could do it in milligrams. So it can vary wildly in size and mean. By doing centering and scaling, we ensure that all the data that we have is in the same ranges. Sometimes standardizing our data is not the best idea. For example, if I'm given discrete data, such as natural numbers, I may not want to subtract the mean of the data, which may be a fractional number. In that case, I can use normalization, which means to subtract the minimum of my data and Again, I can scale, but this time with the difference between the maximum and the minimum of the data, rather than by the standard deviation of the data. Given sufficient data, I can compute more complex statistics of that data, such as skewness or resolve, and use those to transform my data in a way that I think is more useful for the algorithm. Data is often messy and may contain measurements that are inaccurate or anomalous for the general distribution that I'm interested in. For example, in the data set on the right, I can see the two blue squares that are way out to the top right. I may want to remove those, or alternatively, I may want to transform my data with a spatial sign transformation, which means mapping all these data points onto the unit sphere. Data in the real world is often messy and contains missing values. 
There are various techniques that can be done to address this, such as generating a completely random number to replace that missing value, ignoring that value altogether when making a prediction, using the mean value of the feature, for example, in the data set on the right for the age column, finding the average age from those available and replacing all missing values with that age, doing interpolation when my model has a time dependence such that if I know the value at the previous time step and I know the value at the next time step, I can just set the value at this time step to be the average of the two. Or using a more advanced technique like multiple imputation, which is a whole other machine learning algorithm that tries to predict what these missing values should be. I may sometimes have a model that I think would be a great fit for my data, but it requires that my data is in a different shape to what I have. For example, if my model requires discrete data, whereas I have continuous data, I can perform artificial division on this data or find a histogram of it in order to impose artificial buckets where my continuous value fall in. On the other hand, I may have non-numerical data, such as the cats and dogs example that I gave earlier, that I need to convert to numerical in order to be able to perform machine learning computation on it. For this example, there are two main ways to tackle this problem called the one-hot encoding and the embedding approach. Let's have a look at them. Let's say that I have three books that I want to use for a machine learning task. Those books are War and Peace, Anna Karenina, and The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. The one-hot encoding approach on the left assigns to each of these books a vector such that that vector has exactly one entry that is one and all other entries are zeros. We can think of this as the class label for that particular book. You can imagine that if I had five million books rather than just the three, this would get quite tedious and hard to deal with. So on the right, we can see the embedding approach. The embedding approach assigns to each of the books a real valued vector such as 0.53 and 0.85 to one piece with some promise of what the entries of those vectors mean. For example, in the context of natural language processing, it is often the case that these vectors have some semantic connotation, such that if I want to see if two words are similar, I can check whether the two vectors that represent those words are close in the vector sense. Let's look at some of the mathematical fundamentals that underpin the field of machine learning. We first take a brief look into the field of linear algebra, which is the study of vectors and matrices. What is a vector? A vector is a stack of several numbers that we can do various things with. Each number in the vector is called a component to it, and the number of components to the vector is called the dimension of the vector. An example operation that we can perform on a vector is find the magnitude of it, which is just the square root of the sum of the squared components of the vector. We can multiply two vectors together through the operation called the dot product of the two vectors. The dot product of the two vectors is multiplied as the sum of the product of each of the corresponding components of the two vectors. Next, we introduce matrices. A matrix is just several vectors put together. As such, a matrix is going to have two dimensions. The first dimension is going to be the number of vectors in the matrix, and the second dimension is going to be the dimension of the vectors in the matrix. Matrices can also be multiplied together, and matrix multiplication is just application of the dot product over and over for each entry of the resulting matrix. We're going to encounter some special matrices in our study of machine learning, so it's useful to know what to call them. First, there's the identity matrix, which is all zero except on its main diagonal, that is from the top left to the bottom right, where it has ones. 
a property of the identity matrix that you can verify for yourself is that if I take any matrix and multiply it by the identity matrix, I get the original matrix again. Another matrix that we're going to encounter is the inverse of a matrix. This is a matrix such that if I multiply a matrix by its inverse, I get back the identity matrix. This is analogous to the concept of inverses in real numbers, where if I multiply 2 by 1 half, I get 1. So then 1 half is the inverse of 2. Not all matrices have an inverse, but if they do, they're called invertible. Invertibility is a fairly complex property, so it will not be discussed in this brief introduction. Next, there is the concept of a matrix transpose, AT, which is just the original matrix A with its rows and columns swapped. Finally, those matrices that equal their own transpose are called symmetric matrices. The study of matrices and vectors makes up the first important column of machine learning. The other important column is probability theory. So, what is a probability? Most of us have a fundamental idea of what probability is. For example, if I flip a coin, I know that there's a 50-50 chance of it landing heads or tails. Probability theory is taking that intuition and putting it into a rigorous mathematical framework. Whenever there is an event that can have a random outcome, we can introduce a random variable. With the coin flip example, we can name our coin X and we can say that the probability that X lands heads is equal to the probability that X lands tails and is one half. In this rigorous framework, probabilities have to follow rules. All probabilities have to be non-negative. I cannot say that the probability that my coin lands tails is negative 2. And also, the sum of the probabilities of all outcomes should be 1. That is, the coin will either land heads or tails, and if I want to account for it landing on its edge, I need to reduce the probabilities of uh, the first two happening. In machine learning, we want to use the information we already have in order to help us to make better predictions. This is where conditional probability comes in to help us. As a motivating example, for those of us in London, we know that the probability that it rains on any given day is quite high. But if it happens to be one of the few clear sky days, we know that the probability that it's going to rain is going to be zero, at least in the next 15 minutes. We can capture this intuition by conditioning our probability on the observations that we have. Probability theory tells us about the product rule. The probability that event A happens, given that B happens, times the probability that B happens is equal to the probability that A and B both happen. Finally, using this product rule, we can define quite an interesting result. If you recall, during learning, we're trying to learn our parameters given our data. As we're not exactly certain what our parameters should be, we can represent our uncertainty through a probability distribution. Now, if we apply the product rule twice and rearrange some of the terms, we can arrive at the expression at the bottom, which tells us that the distribution of our parameters given our data is dictated by three terms. The first term, the likelihood, tells us how likely it is that our data is generated by the parameters. The second term on the top right, the prior, we have the freedom to select and it represents what we thought the parameter should be before we had seen any data. The final term, the one on the bottom, called the model evidence, tells us how well our model fits the data that we have. This expression is fundamental to an entire subfield of machine learning, so it's worth spending some time learning the names of these different expressions. With probabilities defined, we can now talk about expectations. If I roll six dice, how many do I expect to land on one? I think most of you would agree that the answer is one. 
Expectation calculation allows us to prove this rigorously. Firstly, we know that the expectation of a random variable is just the sum of the value that it takes for a certain outcome times the probability of that outcome. Secondly, we note that expectation is linear. That is, the expectation of x plus y is going to be the expectation of x plus the expectation of y. We can combine these two properties to prove our intuition. Finally, we'll look at the simplest form of machine learning called linear regression. Let's say that I have n different observations of d different quantities. I can represent each observation as a vector of dimension d, and I can stack all these vectors into a matrix of dimension n by d. Let's also say that for each vector x, I also have an observation of a quantity of interest y. I'm going to stack my quantities of interest into a vector y as well. My goal in linear regression is going to be to learn a function that takes the particular shape w x plus p, where w is a matrix and x and b are vectors, such that when I apply it to each of my vectors in the training data, I get something that's close to the corresponding quantity of interest, in the hopes that when I encounter a new data point, I can predict what the new quantity of interest will be without actually knowing it. Let's look at a concrete example. The problem is as follows. I know that two apples and one banana weigh 300 grams, and three apples and three bananas weigh 500 grams. So what are x and y in this particular case? Well, each of the small x's is going to be a vector of the different observations. So x1 is 2, 1, and x2 is 3, 3. And the matrix x is just those vectors stacked on top of each other. And y is going to be all my different quantities of interest stacked on top of each other. So y1 is 300 and y2 is 500. Then, if I want to answer the question, how much do five apples and three bananas weigh? I can prepare a test vector, x star, with five as the first component and three as the second component, and try to infer y star. Here, I've already found the correct weights for the linear regression, such that I know that each apple will weigh 40 grams and each banana will weigh 80 grams. I've also found that my scale always outputs at least 140, even when there's nothing on it. Using that information, we can conduct linear regression as follows. Let's take one of our training examples, the two apples and one banana. I can find what f outputs by finding the dot product of w and 2, 1, which is going to be 40 times 2 plus 80 times 1, and adding in the bias b, which is 140. Summing all those together, I get 300, which was the correct value. This then means that I can take my test data point x star, which was five apples and three bananas, and perform the same computation with those numbers. 40 times five plus 80 times three plus 140 turns out to be 580, so I have the answer to my question. Finally, I gave you w and b in this example, and it will be in the notebooks where you learn how to actually find them. Thank you for listening in.